I welcome this opportunity to talk with you as we approach the 187th birthday of the church on April 6th and anticipate the joyous celebration of Easter. An article in the January-February 2017 Herald is titled, Awaken to God's Invitation. It describes an experience that awakened me to some of God's hopes for the church. Initially, I hesitated to write about that experience. Much of it will benefit from further consideration. However, I've learned to trust the nudging of the Spirit, even when all of the details are not yet clear. I invite you to read Awaken to God's Invitation. It also is included in the 2017 Adult Reunion text. Additionally, the text offers insights and learning activities provided by other church leaders. Near the end of the article, I concluded that there seemed to be several emphases in church life calling for increased attention. They are, number one, spiritual awakening and formation. Number two, shaping church identity to express better the essential meaning of restoration as healing and redeeming agent. Number three, greater awareness of and appreciation for our sacred story and its spiritual power to teach us vital principles for the journey ahead. Number four, broader understanding of the power and possibilities of the sacraments to spiritually awaken the church. Number five, deeper understanding of priesthood ministry, functions, and possibilities. And number six, the temple continuing to shape people who share the peace of Jesus Christ through ministries of peacemaking, reconciliation, and healing of the Spirit with a particular focus on wholeness of body, mind, spirit, and relationships. These statements do not signal the launch of a new program with six goals. They are more like ingredients for the flavorful stew we are making as we anticipate the coming reign of God. Also, these statements do not replace the five mission initiatives. As stated in the article, the Spirit confirmed that the mission initiatives are heading the church where God is calling us. We must stay the course on the mission initiatives. With that said, I will speak today about responding to God's invitation to spiritual awakening and formation. We all like to receive invitations. An invitation expresses care and desire for our presence in another's life. A primary way God relates to humans is through invitation. God's invitation reveals divine love and intent to reconcile, redeem, and gather us into God's universal family. God's way of inviting leaves room for us to choose whether to respond. Such freedom is essential to spiritual growth. God's eternal invitation, what I call God's big invitation, is to live in loving, reconciled communion with God, others, and creation. It's an invitation to salvation that offers liberation from unhealthy mindsets, lifestyles, and relationships that inevitably lead to separation, destruction, and death. God's big invitation comes mostly as a series of invitations that entice us to take steps 
on the spiraling inward and outward pathway to true life in the Spirit. When Jesus said, follow me to the first disciples, he invited them into a spiritual journey that dramatically changed how they perceived God, others, and themselves. Accepting Jesus' invitation altered their lives in ways they could not fathom when they first said yes. To the invalid who had been living a frustrated life of isolation by the pool in Jerusalem for 38 years, Jesus said, Do you want to be made well? That question was an invitation to awaken to the possibilities of wholeness of body, mind, spirit, and relationships. God's invitation is to groups, too. God invites groups of disciples to dive more deeply into the experience and purpose of being the body of Christ today. That is an invitation to form redemptive relationships in sacred community. For example, through the sacraments we experience divine grace and blessing as a community through which the living Christ is revealed. We hear, see, handle, and share expressions of God's invitation to salvation, reconciliation, covenant, and liberation. We grow spiritually as the body through which Christ's invitation is graciously extended to others. God is always inviting. Today, I want to explore God's invitation to spiritual awakening. This invitation is to individuals, priesthood, members, congregations, and the worldwide church. According to Doctrine and Covenants 156, paragraph 3, there is a great need for spiritual awakening. So what is spiritual awakening? Various images come to mind. In fact, spirituality research confirms we have varying personal styles and preferences related to discerning and responding to the Spirit. We need to remember this whenever we plan worships and spiritual enrichment ministries. In his book, Streams of Living Water, Essential Practices from the Six Great Traditions of Christian Faith, Richard J. Foster explores six ways of perceiving and responding to the Spirit. Foster suggests that each stream teaches us something important about how to merge our lives with the river of God's Spirit coursing throughout the universe. Beyond approaches to spiritual enrichment, however, I believe spiritual awakening involves becoming much more aware of God's presence in our lives and in the world. It's about our common need for profound personal and relational transformation. Such transformation comes from the awakening of the human soul to the power of the eternal spirit that leads us to oneness with God. The legendary jazz musician John Coltrane once wrote, In the year of 1957, I experienced by the grace of God a spiritual awakening, which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive 
life. That kind of to-the-core spiritual awakening and transformation is what I'm talking about as our common need. Genuine spiritual awakening changes and enriches how we perceive and relate to God, others, ourselves, and creation. In his book, The Other Side of Silence, Meditation for the 21st Century, Morton Kelsey talks about spirituality as meeting God and learning what God wants of us, which is far more important than what we want of God. What does God want of us? Better yet, what does God want for us? Prayerful reflection draws me to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. This passage highlights the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These qualities evidence true spiritual awakening and transformation. God wants us to be the embodiment of spirit in the world. What blessings might we enjoy individually and together if our life in the spirit produced an abundance of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Think about that in light of the revelatory counsel that Zionic conditions are no further away nor any closer than the spiritual condition of my people justifies. Sometimes we're blind to what we need most. Our egos do not like the notion that I need to change. Our egos constantly try to divert us from self-examination. True spiritual awakening helps us see more honestly our self-imposed limitations. Such limitations often hinder us from enjoying the gospel's greater blessings. This is true for individuals and the church. For example, it is extremely difficult to realistically see our own social, racial, political, and theological biases and how related mindsets limit our experience with God and the gospel. Spiritual awakening is needed to open our hearts and minds to a more expansive understanding of God's will regarding discipleship, priesthood, ministry, generosity, and the blessings of community in Christ. Regarding the church, the Holy Spirit recently urged us to wake up and pursue innovative approaches to support groups of disciples and seekers in a changing world. New expressions of ministry, generosity, and discipleship in sacred community are needed now to respond to shifting religious landscapes and generational differences. Are we spiritually awake, informed, and ready to respond? Spiritual awakening is also about reviving hope. One vivid scriptural account of reviving hope is Ezekiel's vision 
of the valley of dry bones. Israel was in exile, physically and spiritually dislocated. Many wondered if all hope was lost. They lamented their dire circumstances. According to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 2, One day the Spirit of the Lord set the prophet down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. There were very, very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. If there ever were hopelessness, Ezekiel saw it. One time my uncle, who rarely went to church, decided to attend a service. The minister was preaching on this scripture. During the sermon, he paused and spontaneously asked my uncle, Brother, what would you do if you were in that valley of dry bones? My startled uncle blurted out, I would get out of there as fast as my feet would carry me. Fortunately, Ezekiel decided to stay. His experience continued. God said to me, he wrote, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then God said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. Ezekiel did as he was told. Subsequently, he saw the bones come together with muscle and tendon reattached, then covered with flesh. It was a stunning sight, but something was lacking. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they lived. Ezekiel's account of his spiritual encounter holds several vital truths. First, when you find yourself in a valley of dry bones, situation, which can happen more than once in a lifetime, remain calm and stay long enough to see what happens next. Second, when God urges you to speak or act in hope, do it. You never know what may be set in motion. And third, regardless of human outlook, it is never too late for God to breathe spirit into our souls and relationships to awaken us to new possibilities for life and ministry. And that, my friends, is good news.